I am so thrilled to, ha- to welcome somebody who is definitely doing something for good, Leslie Edwin. Hello, Leslie. Hello, Debbie. How good to speak with you again. I am so thrilled. I'm here with, we have a great legal mind here with us today, Brandon Leopoldis. Hi, Leslie. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Hello there. Hi. And, you know, Brandon and I were talking about India's daughter, and he remembers all the, what had the incident in 2012 that that predicated the documentary. And, you know, it's funny because we're talking about legal ramifications of things. Of course, the legal ramifications of what happened to Jyoti Singh uh, is just mind-boggling, absolutely mind-boggling. And you have... Effectively, it has sparked a movement across the world now with this film. So it couldn't be more effective and more positive. And, you know, in the film, her father says, Jyoti, of course, her name means light. Mm -hmm. Such an extraordinarily beautiful um, coincidence. And he says she has become a symbol to disperse the darkness from our world. Mm -hmm. Now, Leslie, when did you, after these incidents occurred, when did you know you had to make, you had to tell this story? You had to shine a light on this gender inequality and this crime. I can date that exactly. It was on the 23rd of December, which was exactly a week after the gang rape. Wow. And the reason that I felt I had to go out there and, you know, it was my way of joining the protests, if you will, amplifying, giving a megaphone to their voices. Um, And it's because these beautiful, peaceful protesters who had poured out onto the streets in a mass mobilization that had not been seen in India since independence, these powerful, passionate, committed voices crying for change, for a better world for women, for a safe, free, and equal world for women, so inspired me, so moved me. uh, And I'd never seen such a mobilization my whole lifetime in any other part of the world. And on the 23rd of December, once they had been out there for one whole week, day after day, the government cracked down on them ferociously mm-hmm. with water cannons and tear gas shells. It was like a war zone. And that is when I decided I have to vote with my feet here, with my talents, with my energies, whatever they are, and go out there and join these protests. Well, I didn't physically go at that point to join the protest, but I joined them by making the film, which then sparked this movement for change across the world. Where did you, in the process of making the film, what was your starting point once you made the decision, I'm going to make this documentary? What was the starting point? Was it go and meet the parents first? Was it talk to the police department? Was it go to those awful defense attorneys. <laughs> it wasn't as reasoned as that. I mean, any reasoning I did was done in my home in Denmark at the time, um, deciding what my objectives were. Uh, so, for instance, I decided that if I could not interview the rapists in this case, the documentary would not have the meaningful answers I needed, which were, why? Why do men do this? This documentary was always going to have three pillars to it. Number one, the heart and the pulse of it was always going to be those beautiful protesters. Mm -hmm. Number two, I knew that I wanted to know specifically what we have lost with this girl's life. You know, in India, she's not named. There were no details whatsoever about her. She was just the 23-year-old medical student. Another number, another cipher. I wanted this film to be a tribute to her in the sense of naming and showing who was this person that the world lost in this hate-filled act, in this gang rape and murder. And the third very important pillar for me is, if we don't understand these men who do this, how do we hope to change them? So I knew I had to interview those rapists. It was a sine qua non for me. And that was the reasoning, if you like. And I sat and prepared a list of 150 searching questions. I consulted with criminologists, with psychiatrists, 
you know, to try and ensure that these were the right questions to ask and would get me insights. Other than that, I didn't plan OLC, the parents first, or I just went with fire in the belly and just knocked on every single door I could knock on. Oh, my God. Well, Leslie, I have a question. How did you actually get to the perpetrators? How how were you able to reach them, and what was that process like of negotiating the the actual content of what was going to be discussed? Okay, so first of all, how I reached them, and this is a question that Indian journalists ask with gritted teeth, because, of course, they uh, have never um, got such access. And how I did it was quite simply this. I asked. I asked. I wrote the most <laughs> impassioned letter to the Director General of Tihar Jail, the maximum security jail in Delhi, where I knew they were incarcerated, and I put my case. I explained that it was in the public interest and to save uh, you know, other girls and women from going through the same kind of hate-filled violations of their human rights. In that interest, I needed to speak to these men. And she, and it may be significant that the director general of the prison was a female, she agreed. I spent a week on this letter. I made sure it was as perfect as it could be. And as far as the rapists themselves were concerned, of course, one of the um, conditions of my permissions was that they had to consent and not be forced to talk. One of them refused to talk to me at all. I didn't even meet with him. Two of them, the young boys, Vinay and Pavan, uh, I met with each of them for about three hours on two occasions. And they were in denial, or rather they were saying what their lawyers told them to say, which was they weren't on the bus that night. They were at a music festival, which had been proved not to have existed by the <laughs> Sessions Court. So there wasn't much point in including them in the film. And Mukesh spoke openly and freely. That... And the reason for that, we have to note, it's chilling. The reason he spoke to me and didn't need any persuasion was because he doesn't think he's done anything wrong. Wow. Yeah, I mean, Brandon and hasn't... that's the truth. Brandon hasn't seen the documentary yet, but I know he's going to. Just yes. Based on what right, I was... You're going to come in L.A., Brandon, right? It's at the Sundown Sunset Theatre from this Friday, 5... Chose the day for a week. Absolutely, yes. I, and I, I highly yes. recommend everybody else go see it as well. Um, yes. Debbie and I were talking that a lot of times we don't see these things in ourselves until we see it on screen. And so I think this is a really important thing that you're doing. Um, and ha Absolutely. And really can uh, bring out some of those prejudice uh, that yes. we are aware of and that we aren't aware of. Well, bless you for that eloquence. And that is the nub of it, you see. That is why the Indian government has banned this film, because it does not want to look in the mirror. Mm -hmm. Well, congratu uh, sincerely, congratulations on having it banned, because that means it's striking a nerve there. Um, and one That's day, right. Indians will be able to see this film, um, yeah. and hopefully but, it will know, strike a nerve. it's also then. so heartbreaking that it's been banned, because remember, I went out there out of positive motives. I was full of admiration sure. for those Indian people, men and women who in, had been so enlightened and poured out onto the streets like that, leading the world by example. I went there with positive energy for change. And, of course, the tragedy is those voices have all been silent and apathetic since that extraordinary or inspiring protest, which lasted for over a month. And, you know, may I just point to another deeply, deeply depressing fact. About six weeks ago, the same Indian government that banned my film banned 897 pornography sites. And I was thrilled when I heard that. I know the role pornography plays in the abuse of women. And guess what? Within one week, there was such an outcry on social media by Indian men saying, we're a democracy. We can't ban uh, porn sites. We want our porn sites back. <laughs> And the government lifted the ban on the porn sites within one week, and the ban on my public interest documentary, which only calls for good for women and girls across the world, that ban is still in place. Isn't that disgraceful? Unbelievable. What now, are their values that they can do something like this, really? Now, I have, to, I have to tell you, Leslie, that your lovely publicist, Sylvia Desrocher, Sylvia's on the line with us now, too. How wonderful. 
I want to bestow an award right now on Big Time PR. They have been amazing. <laughs> Sylvia, I love you. You are so supportive. You know, they've been passionate about this film, and that is so important in terms of, you know, PR, of course, is so important in getting the word out. But when it's just mechanical PR, it's one thing. What big time and Sylvia and Tiffany and Mitch have done and Hector, I mean, these guys are aware of how transformative this film is, and they are working round the clock to get this message out, and I love you all for it. Well, we're so honored to be a part of it, and it's why we do what we do, actually. It's, it's why we work on these kind of films, because it, it fills us with a sense of purpose. And, and that's... Yeah. And that's something I love about I love about Sylvia is that these films she always makes sure that she gets them to me and to others. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, people like you, Debbie, are just as important to us because you amplify our message. So you know, Leslie and I would be nothing without you. We all we all work together, right? It's a it's correct. A but and that's what we have to do increasingly, of course, because mm-hmm. you know, even in the women's movement, there have been such. Splinters. The Indian feminists, it'll shock you to hear, called for the ban. And we are so splintered. I know it's a big struggle for us because the whole issue of, you know, the equal rights for women and girls is the greatest unfinished business in the world. It's the last meaningful focus and concern of the world. So it's a struggle, and every centimeter they gain is precious to them. But you know what? If we don't join hands, and work together, we're not going to see change soon enough. And, That's so true. And yeah, everybody, uh, every part needs to be doing its part, or else uh, we're all going to collapse. Now, so, Absolutely. Now, Sylvia, I think India's Daughter, it's on the list of 124 docs for Oscar, correct? Absolutely. Yes, if there's so, any Ampass members, take note. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And if it's left to Meryl Streep, it's number one, because she has been such an amazing supporter. She opened a screening for us last week in New York and told the audience that she's on this campaign for the long haul, and she is going to keep on campaigning until this film wins an Oscar. Isn't that the most beautiful support from a stellar human being who has a heart the size of a planet. I mean, it's, it's just amazing because Meryl doesn't get behind things, and I think Sylvia can, can attest to this, unless she truly is passionate about them. Absolutely. And you have uh, Susan Sarandon and Sean Penn. I mean, these are not people who just do anything for anyone. No. They, they're very careful about the things they put their name behind, and um, they've really done it from a place of of real support and interest. You know, Debbie, you and I have been in this a long time. We know the difference. I know the difference Mm -hmm. now. I see it when someone is supporting something just because they're going to get something out of it and when someone is doing it because they are Mm -hmm. truly passionate about the subject matter. Yeah. Yes. And Sean Penn in L.A. last week at a launch screening actually said these words. He said, I didn't realize how important films are until last week when I saw India's Daughter for the first time. Isn't that beautiful? And coming from Sean, I, that, that's a, that is high praise indeed. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No. And by the way, we have a screening this week that Susan Sarandon is introducing, and we have President Joyce Banda from Malawi coming all the way from Washington to see and support our film. And is this the one that's going to be here in L.A. at Sundance? In New York. In New, in New York. York. It's the last screening in New York at the Village East Cinema. It's on there the whole week. And then, and then it comes back here to L.A. for everybody to yes. see. Now, at the end of this week, October 30th. Now, Sylvia, how does it impact, as a publicist, when you get to work on a film a docu- or a documentary that's heading out for an awards campaign? Especially a little film like this, that is that thanks to to your efforts and the quality and Leslie's voice and the quality of the film, that is gaining speed and gaining traction, and you've been there from the beginning, and now you're embarking on this awards campaign. How does that impact you as a publicist in your approach to a film? I mean, in some ways, it's, it it doesn't because on every one of our films, we're trying to get the word out as much as we can, of course. And I I can vouch for that. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> in other ways, it does, it does impact what we do because the audience is slightly different. I mean, in this case, we have two audiences. We have the consumers and the general public that we want very much to come and support the film and see the film, be educated and moved by it. But on the other hand, we have all the AMPES members who we also want to be aware of the film. And, and to reach them, it's a slightly different mechanism. Um, for example, with this film, we have, with many of our films, we have clips that we place online as exclusives with different outlets. And um, maybe if we weren't doing an awards campaign, we would have gone more commercial with those, uh, more consumer-based outlets. But for this one, we, we were lucky enough to get some great support from Deadline. Mm -hmm. And they did a lovely little story on it. And that was specifically because so many of the AMPES members, of course, read Deadline right. religiously. So that's an example of, of something that we might do a little differently when we're thinking of an awards campaign as opposed to just a theatrical. And indeed, the rules from the Academy are very stringent, aren't they, Sylvia? That we cannot show more than 10% of our film in yes. total in terms of the trailer that's out there and the clip. So we're limited in having just two one-and-a-half-minute clips and one three-minute trailer, and that's our lot. We're not allowed more. Well, that's and I exactly it, and, and especially because, Leslie, your film is on the shorter side, which is wonderful. You know, it doesn't need to be any longer, but that means we have less footage to work with. <laughs> well, I'm interested, I'm interested in how you pick that footage because... Uh, dealing in what's still a male-dominated society. I mean, even Jennifer Lawrence just recently said she's tired of being nice. I didn't realize she was being nice. And it could just be that from a male perspective, I don't pick up on these things. Um, I'm willing to admit that. But I'm interested on how with the Academy, you have a lot of older white males that are voting. How do you choose the material to include when you're uh, creating you know, the snippets in order to reach them so that even if they're not going to be receptive to the message, which I think a lot of them may not be simply because of the subject matter? They don't like what they, they feel afterwards. What, how do you reach them? Well, Brandon, the first thing I have to tell you is they do like it when they see it. They do actually want to engage. Many men are imprisoned in this stereotype sure. of what the world expects them to be. But they are responsive, and they do want to be enlightened, and they do want change. So... I don't think it's right to say that they resist this message. Most of them who come to these screenings, actually some of them become activists as a result. Um, and the other thing to say is that I haven't chosen any of the clips with any degree of manipulative thinking, oh, this is what I need to use to reach these AMPAS members. The integrity, the truth that this film presents is the only imperative and it's the only factor that I consider, because actually telling the truth is the mission. That is what's going to change things. And so twisting the truth in any way to make it palatable or have a greater reach is just not on our agenda. It's not something we want to do or are prepared to do. That's great. and I highly think that you shouldn't change the message. I'm curious as to... Uh how you were going about that, and I think standing strong in, in your belief um, and really the message of the film is a great way to go. Yeah, I think Absolutely, it's and it's working. Actually, how many people have responded to it. I understand your question, and it's something that, as a publicist, I think about all the time is how our audiences <laughs> sure. will respond. But um, I, I think actually along the lines of what Leslie's saying, I, I think a lot of white, the, like, white men probably don't see themselves very much in the rapists, you know? So, I, I you know, for not, better yeah. or worse, they, um, they're responding to it very positively. So, you know, it's, uh, thankfully... But having of, said that, Sylvia, I agree with you, but I think that one of the strong um, advantages and the power of this film is it makes them understand where a certain kind of thinking, which may be subtle in them, can lead to this when it is adhered to in a kind of uh, slavish way. So they do still recognize that patriarchy and gender inequality, the mindset, is the problem. That's the well, disease Sean we're Penn dealing with. So Sean Penn said that so beautifully at his intro. I was really touched by that, actually, that he said, yes. I, and, and Leslie, you might remember it better than me, but something to the effect of um, the film made him rethink what it meant to be a man. 
Correct. It made him rethink manhood, the notion of manhood. Yeah, and I thought that was really yeah. beautiful. So, I mean, and, uh, on the other note about picking clips, just on a practical note, we do always advise, or if we pick them ourselves, or if the filmmaker picks them, we just try to choose ones that are going to be the most compelling. And you have to remember that people are watching these out of context. So that's the, that's the most important mm-hmm. thing for us, is we try to choose things that play really well out of context sure. and will make people want to see more. And that, I mean, that's basically what I think when I watch them. And Sylvia, you do that even when you're handling a film at the festival level and you're sending out clips. Yes. You know. Yeah. Every film has, a, has clips usually that we pull. It's just if something's at a festival, we usually only send out one because we want to save a lot of that information for later for when a film is at the point where Leslie's film is. And, you know, there's a wider audience that can see it. We don't want to share everything too early. And I would, that would be my, one of my biggest pieces of advice to a, any filmmakers out there is you want to wait to share the most information about your film when it makes the most impact. So you want to wait until the most number of people can see your movie, which for Leslie is now because it's in theaters. <laughs> yeah. Now, will, the, will India's Daughter be expanding beyond uh, New York and Los Angeles? I'm happy to tell you that we've had two offers from independent cinema chains to do just that, and I'm in discussion with both of them, and I'm sure that it will be extending beyond that. Thank God. Thank yes. God. Because this is a film that you know my passion for this film, Leslie, and yes. and how it, and Syl knows how it struck me. I mean, it's like I want, I, the first thing I typed to her after I screened the film it from the car was I want to reach onto the screen and grab the defense attorneys and strangle them. Yes, <laughs> yes. God bless you for that. <laughs> well, I, and, I, and I didn't, and Brandon doesn't know why I say that, but there is, while they are being interviewed, while two of the defense attorneys are being interviewed on screen, the one actually says if his wife or daughter or female member of his, fa- of his family, if they went out without a male family member accompanying them, he would take a can of gasoline, douse them in it, and light them on fire and let them burn. That's nuts. And that was a defense. And he That's believed nuts. it with all yeah. his heart. That's nuts. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I feel for his family and his wife or, and daughter, <laughs> if he has them, I don't. I don't know how he convinced somebody to marry him. I don't know if it's an arranged marriage. I don't know the, the background <laughs> of it. Brandon, here's the worrisome thing. That mindset is ubiquitous. And we really, really have to acknowledge, difficult as it is for us, that it's, a, it's ubiquitous across the world. It's only a question of degree and characteristics. Very much so. I completely, you see it in this country as well. Um, and so you that's, do. One in four girls is raped on college campuses in this right. country. And that's why I in asked this that country, question. Yeah. You don't even have the Equal Rights Amendment Act ratified. That's right. And that's what drives me crazy um, yeah. when we see a film like yours, from what I can gather, where it has a very strong message. I think a lot of people don't like to see those qualities that they know are probably not correct inside themselves. And when you're watching a film... Oftentimes, you're going to relate to the good and bad of characters, even in a documentary. Uh, and so I'm wondering, uh, you know, that was my reason to ask the question of how do you reach those people that they don't like to see the bad in themselves? Mm-hmm. Instead, uh, you know, they're going to vote on the animated feature every year, but they're not going to vote on something that that really has a standing resonance uh, in our community. But I think Well, I'll tell you why I'm optimistic and hopeful. Because I have had a spate of emails from Indian men. And these emails all have the same theme. They're basically reaching out to me for a conversation. And they are variously saying in different ways, of course, expressing the same thing, which is, I promise you that I respect women. I swear to you, I would never lift a hand to a woman. I couldn't even think of raping a woman. But... I recognize my thinking in the thinking of the rapists and the lawyers in this documentary. Help me understand that. Yeah. But they're reaching out, sending me emails, asking for a conversation. They're not running away from it. And that is the most optimistic notion, you know, for me. 
Sure. It's transforming individuals, this film. Well, they're speaking out for a silent uh, group of people in their own country, whether they're family, yes. friends, or otherwise. If they're going to reach out to you, that means there's hundreds of thousands more that are seeing the same thing and wondering why it has to be that way. Mm-hmm. Correct, correct. Well, Leslie, I can't thank you enough for, for joining us. We're going to have another filmmaker calling in here shortly, and we want to hear some, some early PR thoughts from Sylvia, if that's okay with you. Yep. Sure. So, you couldn't hear them from a better person. I know, I know. Leslie, <laughs> thank you so, so much for joining thank us. You. Thank I'm you. I'm so honored. Thank you all.